Sam the Cooking Guy, and you're listening to the Barbecue Central Show. Some call him a fool, some even call him a douchebag, but I say Greg Rempe is the greatest thing to happen to barbecue since caveman. Start the game! Let's go! We'll do it live. Okay. Well, do it live! I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live! So to get that perfect barbecue, you use wood. Are you sure it's safe? Whatever. We put the lighter fluid on, strike the match, and... Oh. Should we call the fire department? That might be a good idea. Welcome to the really big Barbecue Central Show. This is the show that talks about all things that are important to the world of barbecue and grilling. The show originating from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame city, Bomb City, USA, Cleveland, Ohio, the barbecue capital of the North Coast. I'm your program host, Greg Rempe. Happy to have you aboard here on your Tuesday evenings live fire fun and frivolity show. If you'd like to get in contact with the show this evening or if you'd like to follow the show during off-show hours, here's how you do it. You can get in touch with the show by sending an email to greg at the bbqcentralshow.com. Follow us on all the social media channels at BBQ Central Show. And be sure to subscribe to the show podcast feed on your favorite podcast platform. Anything else you want to find out about the show this evening can be found at the main website, thebbqcentralshow.com. And here's what's happening tonight in case you didn't get the newsletter, which you can subscribe to at the main website, thebbqcentralshow.com. Coming up in about 13 minutes from now, a barbecue icon, a writer of multiple barbecue and grilling cookbooks, the authority on the subject matter, as it were. He is now a three-time Hall of Famer across various halls of fame. I am, of course, talking about our pal and barbecue icon Stephen Reichlin. Stephen taking part in the barbecue festival that was staged in a little place called Abu Dhabi last month. So he was actually set to come on last month and was out of pocket exhibiting in Abu Dhabi. So we are back here in March. We'll get the full rundown, how that whole thing happened, who else was there, what the culture is like in Abu Dhabi. Maybe he's been there before. Maybe Abu Dhabi has a storied live fire past and culinary past to boot. All things will be revealed here shortly with Mr. Reichland. Then we'll move 35 past the hour. It's 50-50 right now. Because he's got a job and because he likes to eat dinner, we may or may not have a visit with... Third Tuesday of the month, regular guest spot, 35 past the hour. Wes Wright, cookoutnews.com. Wes started a new day job and is getting through the rigors of that and has had to spend the last number of days in my favorite city across the land, Indianapolis, Indiana. He had steak or dinner, I guess. I don't know if he technically had steak last night at St. Elmo, which is one of my favorite steak restaurants and experiences ever. He's at the Weber Grill restaurant tonight, so if Wes can make it in, and I haven't gotten a message from him otherwise saying that he's not going to be here in about 40 minutes, but time will tell. So hope to see Wes right as we close out the first hour and we'll move to the second hour. Leading off 14 past the second hour, And as much as I will love up on St. Elmo in Indy, I am finally landing the guy that has given me my best restaurant steak experience ever on the face of my life. Owner, operator of Knife in Dallas, now Knife Italian, and also Knife and Spoon in Florida, (laughs) Michelle. Michelin award-winning James Beard, award-winning John Tezar comes in. Finally. 
So there will be a lot of me gushing all over him about the steak experience that I had back in 2021. When I met the guy closing the show tonight, Daniel Vaughn, for a meal before heading up to Denton, Texas to take care of some Peterbilt business back then. But man, it was a steak experience the likes I have not experienced again and can only imagine at this point we'll need to return to Dallas in order to have it, see if it can live up to that first standard that has now been set. So looking forward to meeting and talking with John Tezar here, 14 past the second hour, and then 35 past the second hour, as I had mentioned, quarterly guest and barbecue editor over Texas Monthly, Daniel Vaughn. No sound check with Daniel Vaughn. Very rare communication. I might have to take it up with him. He's kind of sucky when it comes to tech messages, but not everybody is like me and is, is ready to go back with an instant message back when I get the text in. So that's how the show is laying out here this evening. Don't forget, you can follow me socially, Instagram, X, TikTok, and Snapchat, all at the handle at BBQ Central Show. Of course, we say good evening to those of you watching tonight through one of our video streaming platforms. You can go to facebook.com slash BBQ Central Show, twitter.com slash BBQ Central Show, and youtube.com slash at BBQ Central Show where we do have a new YouTube poll question of the week, and we're asking everybody this. A real infrared burner grill is something you wish to add to the backyard, and with early votes in, 67% of you are saying yes, you would like to add that kind of a cooker to the backyard. 33% of you are saying no, that's not for you. Results, final results of the poll from last week, where I was asking everybody if they liked curry, And 54% of you said, indeed, yes, you do. You love the curry. A little closer than I thought it was going to be. I figured I was going to be in the far minority. But at least for all those of us watching live, we were almost 50-50 there. So let's start here tonight. And this isn't exactly where I thought it was going to start now for like the third or fourth week in a row. But the question most frequently set in over the past two weeks was this. Greg, did you really tell Andrew Zimmern that because he didn't have a mic, you weren't going to allow him on the show two weeks ago? And the answer is 100% yes. A year or so ago, two years ago or so, I would have caved and allowed it. But not anymore. I've committed to holding the audio standard that I have set. And by the way, let me save you the emails that you might be crafting Yes, before the Andrew Zimmern segment that was supposed to happen and during soundcheck before I told him it ain't going to happen, Malcolm Reed, who led that show, didn't end up having a mic. So we started the segment. I evaluated the sound as we were going. And while I mentioned during the show that I was letting him off the show early because he had primo folks there, in honesty, it was because the sound was a bit roomy for me and it wasn't meeting the standard, which is why I had someone else literally waiting on standby to jump in and fill the rest of the time. That being newly minted Tennessee embedded correspondent, Matt Osmond. And we thank him for that. By the way, if you go and listen to Malcolm's audio, and then you listen to Matt's audio at the end of the segment, it's a drastic difference. Matt met the standard. That's what I'm looking for. Here's the bottom line. At this stage of my show career, there's no one out there today in any industry with any type of popularity that can knowingly come on this show without the proper gear. It's an effective non-start. If Taylor Swift or Kim Kardashian or Alton Brown, Guy Fieri or Bobby freaking Flay said that they would do the show, but they didn't have a mic and weren't interested in getting set up properly, they would not be on the show. It won't happen. Michael Simon was available to do the show months before I actually had him on last year, but he didn't have a mic. So I passed on it until we could get him properly set up. And when we had the interview, it was great, and he sounded great, and he appreciated it. Andrew Zimmern is as big or bigger than some of those folks I just mentioned. He gets no special treatment for that. By the way, he understood. So 
as a PSA to anyone interested in being a guest on the show, you either meet the sound standard or you don't get on the show. Does that mean I will miss out on some big names? Maybe. But what that signifies to me is this. I, as the host, should be thankful for just getting their time and however I get them and in whatever environment I get them in. And I should be thankful for that. Bullshit. If you're the host of any show, any show, you should care more about your listeners than anything else. And giving your audience a shit-sounding interview with really famous people boils down to this. You have a really famous person giving you a shit-sounding interview. Good for you. You will not find that nonsense here on this show. And trust me, as a listener of many other podcasts and terrestrial, nationally syndicated radio shows, and I know I'm in the minority, but I will continue to put this whole media industry on my back in an effort to raise the sound quality standards. It's ludicrous to proceed the same way that we have been. The standard should be a partnership in sound quality where the host and guests care enough about the audience to give them spectacular listening experiences. And that's the bottom line. It's too easy to do. And the majority of shows don't care or are too lazy to do the right things. Shame on those people. Well, Stephen Reichlin is ready to go, believe it or not, before we get to him. I'm talking about Schwank Grills. Yes, there you see it as I'm talking. Get ready to check out the grill everybody's talking about. You're seeing a lot on social media, of course. It's the Schwank Grill. Here's what you need to know. The unit heats up to 1,500 degrees. It's using infrared burner technology. You can get the juiciest steak you've ever tasted in as little as 40 minutes? No. 10 minutes? No. How about three minutes, depending on thickness? Yes. No more wasting your life cooking the proteins you want. Schwank Grills does it, and it does it with great results. Now, this infrared burner technology that I was talking about, this is the same stuff, like the literal Schwank technology that you're also finding in steakhouses like Morton's. Del Frisco's cut 432 and the list goes on. Remember, at 1,500 degrees, you can build that delicious crust on both sides of the steak without overcooking it. And the steak is incredibly juicy and flavorful. There's truly nothing like it on the market right now. Some are calling it the future of grilling. Now you have multiple different settings as far as closeness to the infrared burner. So if you don't want to force it into immediate crust building you can leave it on the lower level you can work up to it you can leave it on the bottom level to do a little bit less of a heat it's up to you to raise or lower to get it to that intense heat settings that you wanted it by the way it's not just cooking steaks burgers lobster tails chicken breast scrimps you name it if you would grill it in a normal grill you can do it in the schwank you can do it in less time, and you can do it under infrared heat. You got to check it out now, and you can save 150 bucks off right now if you go to schwankgrills.com and you use promo code BBQ Central. That's right, promo code BBQ Central at checkout. It'll save you $150 off the Schwank Grill. You can get it in propane. You can get it in liquid. Um, you can get a liquid propane or natural gas option. So, schwankgrills.com, and then as you're checking out, promo code BBQ Central saves you 150 bucks off the Schwank Grill. You can save money easily. You can enjoy restaurant quality heat. There's a link in the show notes here on this podcast. You can get a link on the show newsletter if you subscribe, or you can go right to the show homepage and click on the Schwank logo under the sponsors section, and then you can order from there. Just don't forget promo code BBQ Central. We are back with our pal Stephen Reichlin right after this. Stick around. We'll be right back. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Show.
Broadcasting live from the Barbecue Central Show Studios in Cleveland, Ohio. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rempe. Welcome back. This portion of the show being brought to you by CookinPellets.com. Your number one source for quality wood pellets for all your pellet-driven cookers. First, go to CookinPellets.com and see what they have to offer for purchase. And then when you're ready to buy, go to Lowe's.com or Walmart.com or Amazon.com. Seems weird, I know. But as Chris Becker has told me himself, owner of Cook & Pellets, they give much better shipping rates. That's the way you want to do it. Great folks over at CookandPellets.com. My next guest, an icon in the industry, a host of TV shows, an author of award-winning, James Beard award-winning, cookbooks by the way and really the authority when it comes to live fire barbecue central shows guest hall of famer if i didn't mention that it's our pal steven reichland steven great to see you we have a youtube poll question of the week that we're asking everybody here as we get going and it's simply this a real infrared burner grill is something you would like to add to the backyard if you don't already yes or no I already have one. You already have one. So we're going to take that already as have a one. yes. In fact, I used it tonight to uh, sear a steak. All right. So 57% of the YouTube voting public and Stephen Reichlin are saying yes. This is something they would like to add to the backyard. So we'll see how those numbers fall out through the rest of the show here this evening. So last month, we were supposed to have a visit from one Stephen Reichlin. However... There was an event that gets in the way, certainly an event that most of us would probably like to tag along and be a part of. And then here's this guy, Steve Harvey, who's putting on this festival all the way over on the other side of the earth. So tell me how a Stephen Reichlin and a former Clevelander, Steve Harvey, might happen to cross paths and put an Abu Dhabi trip together. You know, it was a simple phone call. Steve Harvey apparently decided he wanted to organize the first ever Abu Dhabi Barbecue Festival. And I might add that's the first barbecue festival in the United Arab Emirates. And uh, his people reached out to my people. And a few months later, there I was on a, uh, an Emirates uh, plane to Abu Dhabi. And uh It was an extremely well-organized barbecue festival. I was really surprised. Uh, They had three uh, people from the United States, three uh, grill master, pit masters from the United States. I was honored to be a part of it. Um, It was uh, quite extraordinary. Uh, Abu Dhabi, you know, it's uh, remarkable for so many things. First of all, it's immaculate, no litter anywhere, no graffiti anywhere, absolutely safe. 95% 95% of the people I met uh, were from somewhere else, expatriates from the UK, from South Africa, from the Philippines, from Bangladesh, from Afghanistan, you name it. And they all uniformly said, we love living here. So very cool opportunity. Is there a lot of pitch or a lot of vetting that you and your team have to do on this invitation just to see? I mean, aside from whatever schedule you might be keeping, but is it something that's pretty attractive to you right off the bat? Yeah, it was. And it came to me through uh, a um, speaker's agency. So I didn't have to worry about, like, would I be paid for this? Because, you know, often you worry about that when you're mm-hmm. yep. going so far away and you don't know the principles. But uh uh, you know, they graciously provided uh, business class airfare for my wife and myself. And, you know, I, I, I'm kind of at this point in my life where any opportunity that comes up, I, you know, I feel like, why not? You know, we're, we have a limited number of days on this planet, and I want to have as many interesting experiences as possible. I feel like also this gives you a chance. It's not just for brand reaching, but I mean, you're a, a guy that likes to teach. You've taught all along these many years and decades on television shows. So this exposes you to a new audience, of course, but it allows you to really flex what you're good at, which is teaching the values and the benefits of live fire cooking, I would imagine. Absolutely. And I found a very receptive audience. But, you know, I also learned something. I mean, 
Abu Dhabi, so if you think about it geographically, it kind of lies, uh, it's in the Middle East. It lies halfway, let's say, between Turkey and India. Um, and there's a lot of really interesting grilling that takes place. A lot of Lebanese restaurants, for example. Uh, so I ate great food while I was there. I met great people, very receptive people, you know, um, appreciative people. Thank you for coming all this way. Um, it, it was an A-plus experience, and I uh, hope I get to do it again. Outside of the event itself, do they allow you a lot of time to explore Abu Dhabi in depth, or is that more of a limited thing you're there to cook? Oh, no, absolutely. Well, uh, I went there for a week, the uh, barbecue festival, which is two days, you know, plus uh, an afternoon of uh, prep the day before. So there was plenty of time off to explore, and I had some really cool experiences. Uh, one was an expedition to the uh, desert, uh, where I got to ride a camel, and also a uh, sort of more prosaically a four-wheel, uh, one of those four-wheel vehicles, uh, zooming over the dunes, which was uh, pretty cool. Um, and I, you know, like I said, I mean, for me, whenever I travel, kind of, I ex my first experience of a country is through my stomach, and I just had some terrific food, uh, beautiful beaches. Uh, yeah, it was it was really quite extraordinary. Plus, I was under deadline to finish the uh, my next uh, book. And, you know, with a 14-hour flight going and a 16-hour flight coming back, I put that to really good use. I feel like given your extensive travel history, you're the guy that travels the world's barbecue trail, that you and Abu Dhabi might have crossed paths in the past. True or false? Nope. Never been to Abu Dhabi before. Nope. Do you find with the large amount of expats, as you said, that seem to be making up the population here, that it would yield itself to being a highly diverse food culture, food scene across, you know, all different countries. You're not just going, you know, if you're going to Turkey or if you're going to, I don't know, some other country that might have their own style of cooking and meats that they use. When you have an influx of people that just aren't natives, and they're bringing what they have. This could be a crazy food scene in only the best ways possible. Absolutely. And it was a crazy food scene. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Lebanese food, Turkish food. Uh, I mean, of course, all the American uh, fast food and uh, fast casual food restaurants are there. Um, I, You know, our expedition in the des desert featured some... Uh, Abu Dhabi uh, specialties. I went to an Abu Dhabi breakfast place, which is actually really cool and uh, and really tasty. Big flavors in that part of the world. You know, and if you think about it, like Abu Dhabi, you know, it's Indian influences, Southeast Asian influences from the East, Mediterranean influences from the West, African influences from the South. Um, it was a, it's a, it's a very interesting food place. Is it hot out there? Uh, when we were there, the weather was perfect, like Florida in the winter. However, in the summer, it's, it routinely uh, reaches 120 degrees. Uh, interesting, nobody grills in the summer. Actually, nobody even goes to the beach in the summer because apparently the water the uh, water is too warm. Hmm. Uh, so, But I was there in the winter. Is, uh, so not too far away is Dubai. Is Dubai the place where they have the air-conditioned sand pipes, like the, the pipes of air conditioning that run underneath the sand? At the beach? I wouldn't be surprised. Dubai is the place where they have the mall that has the ski ski slope and ski lift uh, in it. Dubai is actually very crowded, very congested. We uh, tried to go out for dinner uh, the last night in Dubai and wound up kind of spending a lot of time in traffic. Mm -hmm. um, of course, Dubai is the glamour spot of the Middle East. Abu Dhabi is kind of like where Dubai was, I imagine, about 40 years ago. So visit it now. Would you move there permanently? No. no. I, I'm very happy in South Florida and Martha's Vineyard. However, I would visit again quite happily and, um, you know, uh, use it as a stepping point to explore other parts of, uh, of that part of the world. You would mentioned you use the 20 hours of to and fro time to work on the book. Anything you can scoop us on? 
Yeah, so the book is called uh, Project Plancha, and it's a book about uh, outdoor griddles, and for that matter, grill top griddles. I think I mentioned that. Uh, I guess you know, I should say Reichlin has not gone over to the dark side, but I've been uh, I've been using griddling like everybody else. You know, it's the hottest craze in outdoor cooking, and uh, it's a book about how sort of how a lifelong grill guy got discovered the griddle. Uh, at first was skeptical and really found that it can produce some amazing food. What's your favorite thing to cook on a plancha? Uh, boy, I love to do fish on a plancha, especially fragile fish. Like we get beautiful snapper down here in, in uh, South Florida, uh, uh, beautiful pompano. And these are fishes that are kind of fragile, so they're, they'd be quite difficult to cook on a conventional grill, but they're great on a plancha. Last weekend, Stephen Reichlin, the guy we're talking to right now from BarbecueBible.com, inducted into yet another Hall of Fame. This time it was for something called the Taste Awards. Now, admittedly, not overly familiar with whatever the Taste Awards are, so uh, whatever info you can fill in. And obviously, of course, congratulations are in order, another Hall of Fame. So uh, tell us all about it. Well, uh, admittedly, I had never heard of the Taste Awards either, but uh, in the uh, Hall of Fame, uh, some of my fellow inductees included Oprah and uh, Gwyneth Paltrow. So wow. that was pretty <laughs> exciting. They did not show up at the ceremony, however. Uh, but I did bring Mrs. Reichlin, and we were decked out in our finest. Uh, I rarely in my life as a uh, grilling guy uh, have an opportunity to put on a tuxedo, but... Put on my tuxedo. There was a little red carpet uh, procession, uh, a beautiful ceremony. Then afterwards, we went to one of my favorite restaurants in Los Angeles, which is called Key Spaca, and it's an Italian grill restaurant. You may remember from the uh, third season of Project Fire, my PBS TV show, we actually focused on Los Angeles. We went to Key Spaca. It's the place where they do bistecca a la Fiorentina that are four inches thick, where when you order a pork chop there, it actually comes from the backbone of the hog to the belly. I mean, it's the biggest pork chop you'll ever see in your life. And we went there afterwards in tuxedo and celebrated, had great wine, great food, and fabulous weekend. So I was looking through the list of the other inductees aside from Gwyneth and uh, I think Alicia Silverstone was also inducted too. She's you know famous actress from back in the day. Oprah, of course, nobody more famous than her except for you. How many people are showing up that are on? The, I mean, it was a. I think I put out a, a pretty substantial induction list for my guest hall of fame every year with a total of five. I mean, there were plenty of people on this hall of fame list. So how many people? show up and, and actually and do you get to make a, a speech or do they just call you across like you're graduating college or how does the whole thing work well i did make a speech uh and in fact if you uh follow me on instagram stephen reichlin on instagram you can see the speech i tried to keep it under two minutes but it turned out that march 11th the day of the induction was also my birthday Somehow that word had gotten out and uh, everybody in the audience, you know, several hundred people sang me happy birthday. So wow. it was uh, definitely a high point of the trip. Uh, but, you know, what was really interesting about the Taste Awards, it's, it's about food media. And there's so many new media people, social media influencers, people doing TV shows on TikTok, on YouTube, and a lot of people from abroad. And it was really a new generation. I felt like sort of a... a you know, a senior statesman and I, all these incredibly talented young people doing amazing food programming in new media. I mean, media that didn't exist when I started writing about barbecue. So I think that was maybe the most interesting, gratis, gratifying part of the evening was just feeling like the torch is being passed. And you know what? There's as much passion about great food, great grilling and barbecue, um, although it's in media that, you know, is new to me as there was when I was writing. So, you know, the world moves on. When you're watching social media happen and you've come to know quite well some of the most popular uh, food, uh, what's the word, I'm looking, food influencers out there, so, especially so, so in the info, Sure, we did, a, we did a whole show called Influential Grilling uh, yep. uh, on uh, Project Fire. 
when you look at all these accounts, like how many are you buying into as being folks that are as passionate as you are, or at least somewhat as passionate as you are, or what percentage of folks do you think, hey, I think this looks cool and I might be able to make a buck and I'm going to throw it up on Instagram and see if it sticks? Oh, no. I think that the people I follow, I mean, people like Derek Wolf and people like David Olson, uh, Tuffy Stone, they are every bit as creative, every bit as uh, passionate, every bit as uh, smart about their content. Max the Meat Man, you know, as I was in books, you know, life moves on. I mean, I kind of made my world in books and television, and these guys are making their world in social media, and it's uh, every bit as legitimate. They're every bit as serious. I learn from them. Uh, you know, and I, I kind of look ahead and I wonder, like, where is it going to be in 10 years or 20 years? We are on the heels of what some folks would call grilling season. So mm -hmm. as we get into 2024's version, people coming up to you and saying, hey, I'm, I'm in the market for a new grill. I, I held off during COVID because everything was mm -hmm. sold out because everybody else bought everything. But this is the year I'm going to buy. What are your advice to somebody that's looking to get a new grill? Well, I mean, I think, first of all, you kind of need to figure out your grilling personality, right? Like, are you a charcoal person, which is a more process-oriented person? You enjoy building a fire, waltzing the foods from hot spots to cold spots. You know, it's about the process. Or are you a more results-oriented person, right? Do you just want to get the food cooked and on the table, and it's really more about the, the um, end product than the process? I would say... In that case, you're probably more a candidate for a gas grill or pellet grill, you know, where convenience is at a premium. Uh, do you like smoke foods? You know, uh, are you more into low and slow? Do you want to make awesome Texas style briskets and ribs? Are you more like a quick cook guy or gal uh, into the grilling process? Um, you know, do you like Komodo, Komodos? Do you like... Uh, big green eggs. I mean, there's no, you, you know, happily in grilling, there's, and I say happily, there's no one size that fits all. Uh, there are as many different grills as there are uh, personalities of grillers. And um, you need to determine what your personality is first and then buy the grill accordingly. But I'm also a big advocate of multiple grill ownership. You know, you might want a gas grill for the convenience of a weeknight. You might want a charcoal grill or smoke or Kamado for the weekend when you have a little more time. Um, it's, um, well, I mean, if you were to visit my backyard, you'd see a lot of different kinds of grills and smokers. What do you have coming up over the next couple months we should be on the lookout for? Uh, well, let's see. Barbecue University will be taking place uh, right after Labor Day at the Alisal uh, Ranch in Sullivan, California. Pretty excited about that. Uh, the uh, My Windstar project, you know, uh, I have a series the of uh, Star Grill by Stephen Reichlin restaurants on Windstar cruise ships. And the cruise ships are nice because they're small. There's about 300 passengers, you know, which makes them like a tiny fraction of the size of the big uh, cruise ships, but uh, we're working. We have a new menu launching this spring. It's a Mediterranean menu. Uh, what we're trying to do, the first iteration of the restaurant, we're doing kind of American and world barbecue classics. Now we're really trying to tailor the menus for where the ship cruises. So when you're cruising the Mediterranean, it will be a Mediterranean grilling and barbecue menu. Um, what else do I have coming up? That's uh, that's kind of the big so. Right? I completely forgot. So uh, if you're old enough, you may remember my beer can chicken book that came out 20 years ago. Uh, we have decided to reissue that. It's completely redone, updated. My publisher felt like uh, it was time for a new generation to discover beer can chicken. <laughs> so that will be out uh, end of April, beginning of May, and I'll be touring for that. And aside from that, you know, every once in a while I get to sleep. Busy man, as always, barbecuebible.com's website, so make sure you're checking that out and be on the lookout for the re-release of Beer Can Chicken. Stephen, always appreciate the time here, and we will talk to you again soon. You do such a great job. It's always a pleasure. Grill on. There he is, Stephen Reichlin, right there. Of course, talking about...
a number of topics. We talked in depth about the visit to Abu Dhabi. A shocker, never been there, but sounds great. And the passport is once again valid. So who knows? Maybe my next trip is going to be headed over to Abu Dhabi. Well, actually, my next trip out of the country. In June, when we go to the Bahamas, we're going to dip our toe into international waters of the Bahamas. And then we'll see where we go from there. Remember, I said it before, I'm not kidding. There is a very remote chance you could see me in China at some point, believe it or not. I know. Shocker. I do not see West Wright in my switch box, which is not great. Uh-oh. He might be caught in traffic or just having the best meal ever at the Weber restaurant. I feel like I'm tipped up just a little too much. It looks a little better. So as we wait to see if I'm going to have to figure out how to fill the next segment or if it will fill itself, I'll talk to you quickly about Pits and Spits. Believe it or not, just today, Ryan's Borrell and the gang wrapped up their run at the Houston Livestock and Rodeo Show. Remember? That was all the way back in the beginning of, like, end of February, beginning of March. They've been out there exhibiting every day Pits and Spits stuff, and it's finally ended up. That was a record run. So Ryan said, hey, I didn't really make it known but next year why don't I come down stay for a couple days help you push pits and spits pits around why not I think that would be fun NRG stadium very familiar with the area no problem they want to know this though are you tired of settling for mediocre grilling experiences then you know what it's time to step your game up step your game up That didn't come through the speaker. Darn it. Bring the ultimate flavor and cooker to the backyard barbecues. Pits and Spits charcoal grills offering the highest quality live fire cooking experience you can get in the market today. Using either wood or charcoal, their solid fuel grills produce those classic flavors you're looking for when you have the time to fire up the grill and you cook for family and friends. With a large adjustable fuel tray, you can raise and lower the fire to control and fine tune the heat. Their take on the very popular Santa Maria style grill. So if you're not into the classic Santa Maria style, you want something more charcoal driven, but you have the ability to raise and lower the heat, Pits and Spits is the way to go. Visit the website, pitsandspits.com slash BBQ Central. That's pitsandspits.com slash BBQ Central. And as you're checking out, use code charcoal central, all one word, charcoal central for 150 bucks off any charcoal grill. That's the great folks over at pitsandspits.com. And we're going to see what's going to happen next segment. My fingers are crossed and my hopes are quickly being dashed, but we'll see what happens. Stick around. We'll be right back. Stern, Jim Rome, Dan Patrick, and Greg Rampey. The Mountain Rushmore of talk show entertainment. Now, let's get back to the Barbecue Central Show. We thank Stephen Reichlin for joining us last segment. Stephen Reichlin is found at barbecuebible.com. And we have a text message coming in from our pal, creator of cookoutnews.com. A Barbecue Central Show exclusive news update. Greg Rempe reporting from the breaking news desk here in Cleveland, Ohio, the city that breaks the most live fire breaking news across the country. Today, the Globe. 
And I'm here to report that Wes Wright is saying, I'm not going to make it. I'm stuck. Sorry, man. No! So it appears that the topics we were just about to cover for the next 15 minutes are now going to be moved until April's segment. As I mentioned in the front of the show, it was 50-50 at best. It was even 50-50 earlier in the day when we were corresponding and he said, hey, I got this work thing. Not sure exactly how it's going to pan out. And I said, hey, let's just play it by ear. I've often told people when I thought I wasn't going to be able to make it, I've canceled really early. And then lo and behold, I've had plenty of time to spare. And now I'm out of good time. So let's not race to any quick conclusions or decisions and let's figure it out. And then I hadn't heard from him until about two seconds ago. So I was feeling pretty confident about it. But in the end, he's stuck. Now, I don't mean, I don't know if that means he's stuck walking back to a hotel room or he's stuck at the Weber Grill restaurant sucking back fine libations on the company dime and eating tasty steaks and whatnot. Very possible. But no West Wright tonight. We were going to ask him the YouTube poll question of the week that we're asking everybody. By the way, if you're watching on Facebook or you're watching on the Twitter and you want to take part in the Facebook or the YouTube poll, you have to go over to the YouTube channel where you can then vote. That's the only place that you can vote. That's why it's called the YouTube poll question of the week. So go to youtube.com slash BBQ Central Show. No, youtube.com slash at BBQ Central Show. You'll see the show running live. And I believe the poll's up off to the top right-hand side. I don't know. I don't see it as it's happening live. I just hope that it's happening. Let me rephrase that. I can see the poll results coming in and the chat. What I can't see is like what it looks like. I'm not watching a video of the video, if you know what I mean. Anyway, long way to go to sit here and say we were going to ask Wes Wright if a real infrared burner grill is something he would like to add to the backyard. And wouldn't you believe it? Or wouldn't you know? We are stuck back, as we have in many weeks past, a dead heat. 50% of you are saying, yes, you would like to have a real infrared burner grill in the backyard. And 50% of you are saying, no, you would not like to have a infrared burner, a real infrared burner grill in your backyard. So we'll see how the rest of the poll goes. I'm going to vote for Wes. Wes is a guy that gets products all the time. I don't know if he's been reached out to by any of the real infrared companies. Of course, we know the real infrared company is Schwank Grills. There's others out there as well. I think because of Wes's proclivity for getting in and running and playing with a lot of grills, he's going to say yes. He thinks he would like to have one in the backyard, and that pushes us over the 50-50 split that we are currently experiencing here on the show. One of the topics that we're going to be talking about is this. Grilling season is coming up, as I had mentioned with Stephen Reichlin last segment, and we were going to be talking about a few brands that we feel are great, but perhaps they aren't on the radar of folks. So when they're actually going to talk about brands that they're considering hey we're in the market for a new grill this season what should i get well what do you think of pellet cookers traeger gas grills charcoal grills weber more economy style brands charbroil the ones that you see in a lot of the big box stores but there are we have five six different brands that we listed out that perhaps the everyday ham and egger that might be in the market for a new cooker might not know about So we were going to be talking about that. Uh, We were going to be talking about a little bit of Traeger news that was up, which is their outlook for the rest of the year. Sales looking to either stay flat where they're at or dip down a little bit as they continue to work through inventory, blaming a lot of it on interest rates currently, and that the big-ticket items that were impervious 
to inflation and other spend thoughts are now being impacted at this point. Uh, those being the thousand dollar or more of the luxury items as they're called. Uh, they're also looking to add retail sales people to train their dealers on how to best sell. And uh, then there was a story about Pat LaFrieda, of course, America's butcher teaming up or partnering with the good charcoal company. I've tried to have the good charcoal company on here twice. Uh, I was shined on twice. I'm not bitter about it. I would question if they tried to come on again, if they were actually going to be showing up. So I would have an additional segment planned just in case, but I would certainly be open to uh, talking about that. So let me see if I can actually do this. Because everybody was wondering weeks and weeks ago about the uh, where the mic went. I had this all set up. Uh, how do I want to find this? Hmm. Let's go to link. Let's see if I can find the link for me. Well, there's no there's no guest here tonight. So here's a link. That's the first link. That's going to be the... Okay, let me see if I can connect in here. I'm going to go in through the phone. Now, I will tell you that the audio is going to sound much different because I'm going to use the microphone on this phone so you can actually hear. Uh, otherwise, the the microphone isn't going to be... Uh, isn't going to pick up. So let me join the call here and see if that I... Oh, right. I got to enter a name, even though I know it's me. Let's join the call. All right. All right. All right. Okay. Okay. Now. Hello. Why am I still hearing this? Let me put the phone underneath the table. I, I'm hooked up at the moment. So I'm going to mute this microphone that you can't see that sounds great. And I'm going to be going over to the audio on the phone. So again, I apologize in advance. I hope I don't blow you out. Uh, but now we're going to reveal where the uh, new mic is, if you can believe it. So uh, stand by. Right now, you should be able to hear me. Well, that sounds like total crap. Well, that's all right. So I don't normally do this, which is pull the curtain back, give you a full production look. I have the, the stationary camera kind of back left that I'll give you a look every once in a while. But now this is something that's going to be a, a bit more advanced. So let me give you the whole look here. Let me pull up. Now, here we go. This is the whole scene here. This is where, of course, we would have a guest if they were in. Of course, no guest. Green screen there. Now, people ask me, Are, do you have a green screen behind you? This is not a green screen. You can see it is professionally secured to the wall. wall with this blue tape. I believe they call that painter's tape. And then here's the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame city right here. And then you can see where it ends. Let's, you know, this is poster or whatever the hell they call it. Matt Sexton made it for me, a great photographer here in Cleveland. Uh, we got the stationary camera, which is this shot here, right? Then we have a desk where I put my reads. And we have the audio mixer. So digital mixer. Remember, the cat pissed on the last digital mixer. So underneath that box right there is where the new mixer lives. But this interface is how we can actually control it. So you can see, like right here, that's my channel. But I have it muted. So you can't hear me. So you can see the level rising. 
but it's not actually making through to air. So this is the digital mixer board. Now, this is called the Stream Deck. And I have two Stream Decks. This Stream Deck is where all the sound effects have. Drum roll, we have the cheer, we have the hammer. We have uh-oh, right? So all the sound effects that you've come to know and love. And then if I hit the menu button here, now we are into a bunch of nonsense stuff. Oh, and then I can switch with the menu button above that. Now we're in uh, American Idol, which we don't do anymore. I hit the menu button again right here. Now we're into uh, like the, the game show. So the music show that I play with Jess Pryles or when we do some other stuff. That's all where all the production stuff is here. And now we're back to the normal sound effects. Then, the right, here we have all the show shots. So we have the commercial shot here. And then we have the one as the show starts. Of course, we have my main shot here, all that fun stuff. So all that is taking place on that stream deck. So I don't have another person that's over here. It's just me. I'm doing all the engineering. And then as I pull out here, give you a look, we have a three monitor setup. And then just off in the distance there, we have something called the confidence monitor. And the confidence monitor allows me to see what shot we're in with hopefully not giving it uh, away too much. This is the left monitor. This is all the, um, I'm sorry, that's not a, a straight shot there. Um, this is where all the radio automation happens. So segment times used to be where I used to play a lot of the um, show sound effects used to get played through here. But this keeps me on time. And then here we have show outlines, questions. This is where I can see your guys' chat. Yeah. And then on the right, we have show email. We have the show being recorded for podcast audio. And then here we have the YouTube poll question of the week results that I can see. So we're still sitting at 50-50. Now, all to build up for this. Where's the mic? We don't see the mic. Well, good news. There it is. There's the mic. And if you are familiar or you're a huge fan of the show, this is the mic that John Solberg used to use before he got his new Neumann that he's been using for the last week or six weeks or whatever. So this one is lowered out of the shot, but is a shotgun mic. So it's able to pick up my voice, even though it's not in the scene. Stand by as we finish here. So this is where the mic is. This is the mic. This is why you can't see it when I'm in this shot. But you can, and it's just out, like it's just out of sight. So when you, no need to worry, no need to wonder anymore. This is the mic right here. And then uh, we got a few other things here. And the things with the lights there, um, those are the preamps for the microphones. And I think, uh, you know, that's pretty much it. Uh, the gray thing right there, that's the new Tower of Power 3. And again, the real mixer is underneath that board right there. So if you've. I'm going to figure out how I'm going to do this. So if you have wondered, i got to disconnect myself now too, what the actual setup looks like. Well, guess what? There you go. Looks just like that. There's no mystery anymore. There's no behind the scenes. There's no professional studio. Uh, this is the way it is.
So if you missed it, sorry. And even though the microphone isn't in the shot anymore, I think that you'll agree if you spent the last eight minutes with me on phone, audio, and then we go back to a $1,100 microphone. This is why you get the sound that you get. And we've, we've, I've invested time and time again, sponsor money back in to get bigger computers, better mixers, better, uh, a piece that's like the stream decks and the, uh, the iPad for the digital mixer controls and all the different monitors and the lights. And it's a constant reinvest to make sure that I'm trying to provide you with the best. Now I have to say this, if you're listening on audio podcast, that was horrible for you. You got to hear bad audio that I just ranted about in the beginning of the show. But I was my own caller, and of course I'm a hypocrite, and I break the rules for me. Yes. But you can go back to the video archives on Facebook or YouTube or Twitter and fast forward in about 35, 36 minutes to the show, and then you can also get the behind-the-scenes look. I'm debating now quickly in my head if I'm going to just cut that out for the podcast listeners because I am I know the sound was pretty hot. I'm looking at the waveform there and the recording software, and it's much bigger than anything else that this mic is putting out. So that'll be game time decision as the show ends. But for everybody that's wanted to look behind the scenes, intimately detailed, that's what it is. Uh, Sean Ludwig is asking, Greg, how much do you estimate this impressive setup cost you? I, I mean, I don't know anymore. Uh, the computer, when I replaced it this time around, like two months ago, whenever it was, that was 3500 bucks. The microphone's 1300 bucks, uh, but I didn't pay for that. John has it on lend to me, but it's uh, like an eleven or $1,200 microphone, I think, at retail. Uh, the preamps were probably a good two, 300 bucks a piece. They're very professional. The stream decks, uh, if you go to elgato.com, you can get, stream decks these are the stream deck xl so i could get more buttons on them i don't know if they were a couple hundred bucks a piece but maybe close to that uh monitors are pretty cheap these days uh so i think these were all 125 bucks or less uh, the other microphone was like a 300 hundred dollar microphone the the electra voice re20 which is a broadcast standard microphone the microphone i'm using now is not one that you would normally see in a radio station but the one um on this shot here uh, which you can see is one that you would see in a normal broadcast uh radio station so i mean it's uh, sean I, I don't have a total because i've upgraded pieces at a time i would never suggest that anybody decides to start something like this and then goes into debt over this. You don't need to get all this stuff to do a great sounding podcast or live stream. And if anybody ever has any questions about where to start, how to get started or money to invest and money to not invest in, then certainly I'm happy to have those conversations with you. So you don't have to go through the same learning curves that I have. So hopefully you enjoyed that. And Continuing to produce incredibly mediocre content in an exceptionally professional way. You're listening and watching the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rampey. And we welcome you back. This portion of the show being brought to you by Fireboard. Fireboard 2, Fireboard 2 Drive. You can monitor up to six different temperatures simultaneously. Connect through Wi-Fi. You can connect through Bluetooth if you want to, but I connect through Wi-Fi, of course. You can monitor through the apps. It's all great. So visit fireboard.com to get all your questions answered and check it out from there. I thank me for joining you last segment. Some of those topics that I had lined up with Wes, we can get to next month because they'll be evergreen at least until then. And if you had any questions about my setup and what it might look like past this shot, because this shot looks great. But when we pull out away from it and show you the basement walls and the painter's tape, a little less sexy, I know. But I'm here to share. 
All right, we're pointing to the second hour, refresh libations, and we'll be back. Stick around. This is Jenny Bell from Clarington, Ohio, and I'm listening to Barbecue Central. Happy to have you aboard here for the really big barbecue show. Boing. We cook because we have to, and we grill because we want to. Hit me. Fine, how you doing? You have a great show, I'm a big fan. So what 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 seems to be the problem here? This man looks like he's dead and he's in the in the crackle. Charbono! It's all about the Charbono, dude! Succulent fish! What? He ate two feet before we knew. So listen, Liberty, it's a shit feast. I'm shaking like a dog shit peach seed. <laughs> we have top men working on it right now. <laughs> top men. And just like that, we are into the second hour of the Barbecue Central show. We cover the most high-line, important, and pressing items of the barbecue and grilling day here every Tuesday evening, live between 9 and 11. We'll do it live. We are also recording for podcast uh, shows that are shows that are videos are auto archived as soon as the show ends every Tuesday night. You will get audio archives for hour on Wednesday. That's tomorrow. Second hour on Thursday. We'll talk about Friday here in just a second. Still to come on the show this evening. First timer John Tzar of Knife Dallas. Brand new Knife Italian. Knife and Spoon out there in Florida. So looking forward to meeting and talking with him for the first time. And closing out the show, Daniel Vaughn from Texas Monthly. And as I say that out loud, I think to myself, might be a good idea to send Daniel the link that he probably needs in order to do the show. So we'll copy that. We'll go over to the email blower. And fill this in. There we go. And he's off and running. Let me get back to my sheet here. By the way, the show originating from... Bomb City, USA. Cleveland. We say good evening to those of you watching tonight through one of our video streaming platforms. As I had mentioned, facebook.com slash at BBQ Central Show. No, Facebook.com slash BBQ Central Show, Twitter.com slash BBQ Central Show, and Facebook.com slash at BBQ Central Show. There is, as always, a robust chat going on over at the YouTube page, and we also have a YouTube poll question of the week, and we're asking everybody this. A real infrared burner grill is something you would add to the backyard, yes or no, and we're currently still at a deadlock of 50-50. Of course, that would be the deadlock, uh, 50% saying yes, and 50% are saying no. So we'll see how that progresses through the rest of the second hour here. Coming up on the best moments of the Barbecue Central show in 10 minutes or less. This Friday, episode 325, taking you back to December 5th. 2017. Hmm. No, that's not right. That was last week. Stand by. You're going to get a quick update. Let's go to the Dropbox and we'll go into the finals folder where we will see episode 326. Wow. This one from April 29th of 2008, so only two and a half months in to the live show's existence. 
Anybody, can anybody place this name? Bill Small. Anybody tell me where Bill Small is from or who Bill Small is or what his nickname was? I almost gave it away there. Well, if you don't, and I'm almost 100% sure that nobody knows the name Bill Small, especially with the group that's in the chat room right now, you will be introduced. I don't think I, I had him on a round table at one point. What was that one? The pulled pork round table? I think it was pulled pork. It was him. It was the former official voice of the show, Captain Morgan, Jim Morgan. And I think Finney was on there as well. Chris Finney, the creator of the Finney Method, which has grown into the reverse seer method. So you will be introduced to a guy by the name of Bill Small on Friday. And again, that dating back from late April 2008. You can subscribe to this show and the Best Moments show by visiting the BBQ Central Show.com slash subscribe. You can only get replays audibly if you subscribe to the audio podcast, and that's the way you do it. And don't forget, if you want to hear a guest or segment again that's been lost in the archives, you can email John and let him know what you would like to hear. J O N at the BBQ Central Show.com. I know a lot of you thought I was going to be talking about this, which was the smoke on the shores debacle from this past weekend. And no, I'm not going where you think I'm going on this. I shared a post of a judge at this event who posted pictures of turn-ins on the show page. I was told after the fact he was given clearance to do so because he was media. Okay, now I can be a bag and debate the rule because media can document the judging process as long as they don't impede the process. There's a subsequent rule that states that judges are not allowed to take photos. They're what? Andrew, you are not, not allowed to take photos. They're not allowed to take photos during the judging process. So the ability to debate comes in this instance. This particular judge is a weatherman for a local network affiliate in Tennessee. So he is technical media for his job. However, he was acting as a certified barbecue judge at this event. So when you show up and your job is media, but you're showing up to do a CBJ event, do you then in turn give up your media credentials when you pick up your judging responsibilities, thereby, uh, thereby making it illegal to take the pictures or not? That's the gray area that's up for debate. Again, he was told it was fine. I'm not here to debate that. I could, but I won't. So who cares? I'm also not going to talk about the scoring issue that happened at this event. The same issue that happened at Brian Jarvis's event a few months ago in Atlanta, where backyard teams and pro teams got mixed together when data was merged. I'm not going to mention that. And I'm certainly not going to mention that in an odd twist of coinky dink, the KCBS CEO again, was on site at this contest. Now, he was probably checking out the location, getting the lay of the land because it's the same place that the KCBS World Championship is going to be. And once again, the CEO of KCBS leaves before the awards actually took place and then were ultimately canceled because the backyard and the jumbled up. At best, at best... It's a bad optic again, but I'm not even going to mention that. I'm not going to do it. What I am going to talk about is this. Sunday, I get a phone call from No Names Please board member of the KCBS and says, hey, I just got a phone call from Jason Cole, organizer over at Smoking on the Shores, and he wanted me to give you a call because he's hearing a rumor down there that you're going to get on the show Tuesday and talk shit about smoke on the shores and how they used KCBS to sanction the event. We quickly wrapped up the session on the phone, no names please, and said, I don't operate like that. He knew that. He told Jason that. Look, I know Jason. He's been on the show a couple different times as a guest. I respect him. He's a former KCBS board member, obviously doing things well on the competition side of things. 
There's only one thing I want to know. I'm keenly interested in finding out what piece of shit person decided to get that rumor going on down there. I can tell you that aside from talking to my embedded correspondent that happened to be competing at that event, I talked to no one else about this. Nor did I mention anything about it or post anything that I was going to get on this show tonight and talk shit about smoke on the shores. Why would I do that? I don't care who they have sanctioning the contest. Why wouldn't they want to have KCBS sanction their contest from a high level? They're the global leader, uh, global leader in sanctioning barbecue competitions. It just so happens that right now, maybe a lot of people are questioning the ability to do that on a consistent basis. If the person who started the rumor is listening to this, be a man. Come on this show and let's talk about it. I will cancel any and all guests to make sure that I have a spot and enough time so we can hash this out together man to man. And if you see me on the street, make sure that you stop me and let me know. Because if I see you, I will fight you. One of my favorite rappers of all time, Ice Cube, said it best when he said, a bitch is a bitch. Know this. If you're putting on a barbecue contest, if you're the organizer, I will never talk shit about you. You are doing what few people do. You're doing what fewer people do now more than ever, which is put on barbecue competitions. And by the way, everybody should be taking notes from Jason Cole. There were like 150 teams at that competition. That's unheard of anymore, 150 teams. So somehow, KCBS, the scoring system, has been able to screw up three of the biggest attended barbecue competitions in the last six months. The American Royal... Brian Jarvis's event in Atlanta and smoke on the shores. That's a black eye. That's a shame because Jason did everything right. He found a way to get interest, to get teams down there, provide a winning environment for everything involved to get that many teams down there and those quality teams down there. And then he's got to put up with that. No, I'm not going to get on this show and talk about why did Jason Cole do this? His expectation is correct. Judging should happen. Results should happen without flaw. No fail. It doesn't happen right now. Not Jason's fault. Wouldn't have mattered if it was FBA, St. Louis Barbecue, CBA. I don't care. I'm not talking shit about anybody organizing a contest. I'm excited to talk to John Tezar here in just a second. Before we get to him, let's talk about Primo Grills. Next month, Nick Bauer is going to be on. We're going to be talking about the release of the Primo XXL. Yes. Malcolm mentioned it last uh, two weeks ago when he was on the last time. What do we love about ceramic cookers? We love that they're fuel efficient. We love that you can get low and slow temperatures and high heat temperatures as well, all in one cooker. They're very fuel efficient. But achieving a two-zone fire in most ceramic cookers isn't very realistic because they're round. Well, with Primo's oval design, now you can achieve the two-zone fire that you're looking to set up. You can bank all the coals onto the left side, put your divider in, you have a complete void on the right side, you can figure out where you want to put your meat, you can even step it up and put deflector plates in if you want now. All the accessories that you want, only sold through dealers, Go to primogrill.com, find the dealer near you, visit the dealer, and then buy the oval that best fits your budgets and needs. And don't underbuy. We don't want any buyer's remorse here on this show or from Primo. So do the right thing, and if anything, buy up. Nobody's ever complained about buying up. Primogrill.com, follow them on Facebook and Instagram as well. We're back with John Tezar right after this. Stick around, we'll be right back. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Show. Stern, Jim Rome, Dan Patrick, and Greg Rampey. The Mountain Rushmore of talk show entertainment. Now, let's get back to the Barbecue Central Show. 
All right, welcome back. This portion of the show being brought to you by Pit Barrel Cooker, most unbelievable outdoor cooking device on the planet, currently available in three sizes with a host of accessories. Doesn't matter if you're a beginner or a professional, it's a cooker you want to add to the arsenal. You visit pitbarrelcooker.com and then tell them the Barbecue Central Show sent you. It will be a great achievement in addition to the backyard cookers that you might already have. My first guest in the second hour is someone who I have been efforting since back in early 2021, if you can believe it. When I ate at his restaurant in Dallas back then, it is the instant... <laughs> It instantly rose to my favorite steak restaurant experience I have ever had in my life. And I have been trying to find a way back to Dallas ever since to try and get that experience again. He's been on TV shows and won some, written books, won Michelin stars, won James Beard awards. And you might know his proclivity for dry aging beef. I am excited to welcome first timer to the show, John Tezar. John, how are you, pal? Great. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm excited I, and I'm glad we can connect tonight. I, I can't see you. Did something happen with your camera? Yes. Hold on a sec. All right. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. I'm a little. Okay, hold on. If we can't get it up, there's no worse. We're going to have to isolate that sound that I just said because that was weird. Okay, sorry. No problem. Um, I, I don't think you're going to be able to see me, but you can definitely hear me for sure. We're going to go old school move. radio. We're, We're just going to sound better than old school radio, so no problem. And uh, given the instance here, John, I'm very appreciative of your time. Uh, we have a YouTube poll question of the week that we're asking everybody right off the bat. So anybody in YouTube watching is answering, and then we're also asking guests, a real infrared burner grill is something you would like to have in your backyard, yes or no? Could really need a lot of heat, so definitely, um, you know, these backyard broilers, much like the Swank that um, I'm using now, is incredible. You know, that's what you want to use. You need that intensity, and it's going to give you a steakhouse result. Um, and I think that's really, you have a great cut of meat, you know, especially we dry age steaks for a time, you know, all the way up to eight months. And the last thing you want to do is, is house that steak and not give it the. You there, John? Oh dear. Well, this is turning into something here. Gone. Get that stuff out of here. Well, this is a shame for me because to say I've been excited for this interview would be a bit of an understatement. So we'll leave the marker there and podcast I, people. I'm sorry about the technical yeah. I'm just breaking up here and I. So, I John, let's I do this. Move the. Uh, I, I know you Tonight's came. Conversation I know you came back. And I'm, and it's, it's, yeah, it's yeah. Let's let's uh, let's let's reconnect. We'll we'll get it reset up when you're in a better spot, and uh, you know we'll do it again. Uh, and and good luck with the the uh, the opening of the new restaurant that I know you came back for. Okay, tonight. you want to try? <laughs> I, I'm I'm back. If you can hear me, I don't know. I can hear you. Yeah, let's 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 we can do this at another time. Okay, okay. if you can hear me now, let's go because we're good. I, I'm sorry about that. All right, you can hear me like live right now. No. I can, yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. right. mm. This is driving me crazy. I apologize. <laughs> okay. 
John, <laughs> if, if you can hear me, um, let's let's just cut it now. I can hear you. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, okay, and we'll reschedule. Yeah. We'll reschedule, and okay. uh, and that way we can start fresh right from the top. Uh, I apologize if you were you know racing back from the the opening of, of Knife Italian, uh, but I want to make sure we we have this good conversation and we're connected well. No, for sure. I, I definitely want to have a solid conversation. I've been waiting to talk to you for months. So okay. let's reschedule it. I'm sorry to the audience. Um, and uh, we'll be back as soon as you can have me on, Greg. Appreciate it. Thanks, John. Thank you. Oh, it's John Tezar right there. Oh, so close. So certainly I'm going to be going right back to the calendar and trying to get John reconnected. Uh, I saw just as I was punching up his button there that uh, this is what I saw. <laughs> Signs that things might not go well. That. Here's the shame of it all. I don't want to let the cat out of the bag or, or talk out of school, but John, well, I guess I kind of let it out of the bag when we were wrapping up there. I would imagine for the last number of months, maybe longer than that, Knife Italian, which I believe is in the Dallas area, forgive me if I'm wrong on that, has been getting ready to open. And for the last number of days, uh, Knife has been doing, uh, do they call it a soft open where... They don't charge you for food, but you go there and get to eat off the menu and all that. Friends, family, hookups, blah, blah, blah. So he's been dealing with that. So the free stuff has been happening like the last two or three days. Today, tonight, Knife Italian Grand Open. <laughs> So imagine my sheer disappointment on many levels here as we sit at 1021 East and I can't make the connection I want with John Tezar for, for any number of reasons. His, the restaurant grand open tonight on a Tuesday and he leaves to come back to wherever he was at to do the interview with me. And he should have stayed at Knife Italian, of course. So I wanted to talk all about what it's like opening a John Tezar conceptualized Knife Italian restaurant, the work that goes into it. Obviously, I wanted to talk about the steak, the dry aging, of course. A bit of his background and the dining, yes. But we're going to have to retry again. So I'll get into the calendar after the show. We'll... Look at some open dates. Maybe I'll have to bump some recurring guests to try and make this happen sooner than later because I was very excited about that. So I apologize to everybody who was tuning in for that. It's not going to happen. We will duck out early because wouldn't you know it, our pal Daniel Vaughn is in the green room, and we'll talk about some barbecue topics here. When we come back, uh, this allows me to catch up a little bit anyway. If you're in the market for a premium offset barbecue pit, what do you want to be looking at? The Franklin Pit. So if you're not by a dealer near you, you can buy online. Go to franklinbbqpits.com. That's franklinbbqpits.com. Buy online. It's shipped right to the bottom of your driveway. Then you can go ahead and uncrate it and then wheel it where it will be Living for the majority of its life, I would imagine. 600 pounds, I believe. Steve Ray over at Owl's Nest Barbecue, who happens to be a certified Franklin dealer, had a buddy of his, Flamin' Red or Big Red or whatever his name is, and he did a great talk-up, a walk-around, in-depth review of the grill. Uh, never lit it, but did the whole walk-around in the showroom, let's call it, the virtual showroom. So if you're interested, go to Steve's Facebook page and you can watch that. In the meantime, know this. It's built with 5 16 and quarter-inch thick American-made steel. Anything that sees heat is engineered to be incredibly solid and should last at least a century or more if cared for properly. 
The thickness of that steel guarantees professional grade heat retention, which is a critical component to making great barbecue. Every Franklin pit is unique unto itself, which includes their own natural markings and its own badge number. How about that? You got one of however many. If you, the listener, want to own that Franklin Barbecue Pit, again, go to franklinbbqpit.com. If you're an owner of a barbecue supply store, you're looking to bring in a high-quality offset pit, and you want to become a certified Franklin dealer, go to the same website, franklinbbqpits.com, fill out the dealer form, and then get ready to get a call going with Matt. He'll get you set up as a dealer, and then you're off and running. And again... Where I'm at, still kind of cold. It's like 32, 34 degrees here today. We had snow yesterday. It'll be 60 in a couple days, of course, because we're here in Cleveland and the lake is not frozen, so who knows what you're going to get. But in the meantime, you can get going on increasing the dealer network. That's what we're looking at here during the cold months as we bridge into grilling season, which is shortly upon us. FranklinBBQPits.com. That's FranklinBBQPits.com. Daniel Vaughn, after this, stick around. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Show. Whole packers, full racks, legs and thighs, injecting butts. If you've never heard this before, you might think you found the best triple X show ever. Let's get back to the most homoerotic host out there today, Craig Rimpy. Welcome back. This portion of the show being brought to you by, trouble talking tonight, uh, being brought to you by JRE Tobacco, makers of Aladino cigars, the classic, my favorite, the Corojo Reserva line. They also have a recently released Sumatra cigar. And if you follow my social media today on Instagram stories, they're releasing a brand new cigar that hopefully is coming this month for me. If you don't have a retailer that's currently carrying JRE Tobacco products, tell them shame on you. Now go to JREtobacco.com and fill out the forms to become a retailer. They'll send a rep out to you, get you all set up. That's the great folks over at JRE Tobacco helping me close the show this evening is the barbecue editor for Texas Monthly Magazine, quarterly visitor here on this show, Barbecue Central Show's guest Hall of Famer. We welcome back our pal Daniel Vaughn. DV, we're asking everybody a YouTube poll question of the week tonight, and it is this. A real infrared burner grill is something you would like to add to the backyard, yes or no? No. No. Well, you might have bridged back. No, you've added to a recently discrepant poll. It was sitting at 50-50 probably for the last 10 minutes, but is now 52% no. So let's say now 54% no with your no added in and 48% yes. Why no takes on the infrared burner grill for you? I mean, really, it's just that a charcoal chimney is just too easy to light. Um, that's really what it comes down to for me. Like I have gotten, I, I've got everything set up in my backyard to, to light, um, charcoal chimney really quickly. Um, I've got all the right starters and, and all that going on. So, uh, it takes no time at all really to, to get a good charcoal fire going. And I just love the flavor of that more. We've got a lot of different topics to talk about here this evening and uh, no need to rush through because while my favorite love crush was scheduled to be on ahead of you unfortunately connections and cameras and technical snafus didn't work out so we weren't able to have it that being john teaser i remember that march day of 2021 like it was 17 minutes ago an incredible steak dinner capped off by a dessert cheeseburger uh, that i did not take the onions off of and it was probably one of the best cheeseburgers i've ever had in my life now certainly when you look at a dining experience, there's other things that you have to take into account. The restaurant itself is very unique looking, has a, a great atmosphere, a great je ne sais quoi, as they say in France. But of then course. it's also the company. So here I am outside of a show setting, 
sitting with Daniel Vaughn and uh, your buddy that uh, came along just in case I got caught up in traffic or plane delayed too much and wasn't able to make the reservation because you had to pay for the reservation in order to keep it. So he was the backstop, but he was a great guy and we all had this great eating experience. So when you take into account, like in reviews, do you make it a point to ride solo only because you don't want to have a good buddy or two good buddies go along with you and cloud what might be some average barbecue get stepped up a few notches because you're having some fun with your buds. Uh, it, it, yes, it is easier certainly to evaluate a restaurant when you're on your own um, than it is with, uh, with company. Uh, but it's really not because uh, I really let their opinion sway mine. It's, it's really about the amount of attention I can really pay to the food right Mm. uh when you're when you're in the midst of a conversation you're not really picking up on all the details of all the different meats and all the different sides um you're more caught up in in that conversation right and and caught up in making sure everybody gets uh the pieces that they want to get uh when i'm eating alone i'm picking all the best bites for myself and, and really being able to evaluate it that way. So it's not so much about the other diners opinion sway in mine. It's really more about just the, um, just the attention I can pay to the food that's in front of me. And, and that's really the thing about being a food writer that I think most people don't really understand. It's really, uh, it's really all about observation, right? It's, um, it's about observation of, of what the setting looks like going into it, the smells, uh, the sounds, the sights, uh, all of those things before you even get to the food. So that observation then continues, obviously, when you when you get to the food in front of you. And that just is made more challenging by people around you. What do you think the popularity here in 2024 is of dry aged meat, regardless of 20 day, 28 days, 60 days, 90 days, 400 and 800 and 50,000 days, whatever. I mean, you get pretty stretched out. What do you think it is compared to four or five years ago? Um, I mean, I think it's not so much about the popularity. I think it's about more of an expectation, right? If you are a certain level of steakhouse, then you are going to be providing that. Like, I don't think if you are a uh, a truly upscale steakhouse, uh, you can't just have wet aged options right dry aging is is kind of a requirement these days um i mean for me um and i I, i'm reminded of it every time i go out to get uh, go to a place and order a steak that is a a wet age steak or something that i can get in the store like i just simply prefer the way that i'm going to cook it better right and there's nothing they can do in in a restaurant with that piece of beef that I can't do at home and probably do it better just because I can pay attention to that one steak. Right. And I can season it the way I want. I can serve it the way I want all those things. Um, but what I can't do at home is dry age. Right. I mean, I, I don't have a dry age cabinet, uh, or anything like that, uh, to, to be able to do my own dry aging at home. So if I go to a steakhouse, that's what I want to try. I want to try that dry aging because uh, from restaurant to restaurant, the dry aging itself changes, right? The, the different molds that they introduce into the dry aging room, uh, the different humidity and temperature that they choose, uh, sort of the funkiness level that they want of that dry aging. So each dry aging program is going to have its sort of individual flavor too. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I think... Uh, Adam Perry Lang and uh, when when he opened uh, uh, Carnivino in Las Vegas uh, a long while back, it's it's a long gone restaurant, uh, but he was really the first to to bring about dry aging in, in, in a major way. Right, John Tizar learned a lot from his experience going to that restaurant, um, and then Adam Perry Lang then went and opened his own place uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, which is also now closed, APL Steakhouse. And I, I say all that just because they dry age for the same amount of time, similar grades of meat, similar same cuts of meat, all those things, right? But the sort of air movement and the type of uh, mold that Adam Perry Lang was using uh, was much just more subtle, right? And the stuff that, that 
what Tzar prefers, which is that like really Parmesan, sometimes Swiss cheese, but it really just punches you, especially if you get meat near the bone. Um, and so that individual character comes out and that's just one of the ways that a steakhouse can set itself apart. If I got you a, a long, dry, is that a long enough answer? <laughs> yes. If I got you a dry ager at home, would you be interested in dry aging at home? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would be interested in doing that. I would not. I mean, yeah. No, I, I, I don't know how often. So in my head, I'm like, man, that would be great to have. And then I have to buy the, the hunks of meat to put in there. And then I got to wait 30, 60, 90, 120 days or whatever I'm going to do. So I don't like to wait. So if I want a, a, a dry aged steak, then... I can go down to Fahrenheit downtown or I can go to, you know, somewhere that I know that's going to have, you know, at least a 45 day dry age steak to get some of that funk and get it that way. Because the other part that scares me is I'll get it in there. I'll get a dry age. And then am I going to have it like every night for a week or every night for a month or how much meat am I putting in there? So am I not going to eat it? So it's, it's both things for me. Like I don't want to wait. And then I don't want to also overshoot, so I'd rather just not do it. Yeah, I can understand that. I mean, whole muscles, like, you know, whole big pieces are the, are the best thing to dry age, so that, that whole rib section. But when you cut into it, like, it's time to cook it all, right? Um, so, yeah, you got to be cooking for a crowd. But uh, I think I would uh, have a little fun playing around with, uh, you know, different proteins, things like that. I was in San Diego recently. Uh, at Cali restaurant and they were doing uh, C-A-L-L-I-E and they were serving a, a dry aged duck breast and it was mm. it was just incredible so I, I would like to try some different proteins and, and see just what dry aging has an effect on them beginning of the year John Brotherton passes away and you weren't slated to be on the show until now and somebody who was covering the Texas barbecue scene I'm sure you've had more than a few run-ins, conversations, and good time spent with John. So for the folks that are familiar with him, maybe you could give us a quick background on him and then what the loss means to the community. Yeah, John Brotherton uh, was a uh, sort of serial entrepreneur. He, was, uh, he wasn't going to quit until he got the right barbecue joint. He had a food truck. Um, he had a, a partnership in a restaurant. Um, that ended up going under in in Round Rock, just north of Austin, uh, and then he he finally uh, got his hooks into Black Iron, uh, which turned into Brotherton's Black Iron Barbecue. And at the time, it was a, a sandwich shop, and he, he was really just doing pop ups out of there. And then he, you know, the the owner and he decided they should really collaborate on on sandwiches using John smoked meat. Those became so popular that eventually it just became a barbecue place. It just became Brotherton's Black Iron Barbecue. Um, they expanded the space. They took over the space next door. Um, it was just growing in popularity. It was uh, it was getting better and better I, I, every year. Uh, it made our Texas Monthly Top 50 uh, in 2021, which is the most recent one we did. And, you know, it... Uh, Obviously, his death is incredibly sad. For me, one of the, the, the sadder parts is as somebody who's uh, witnessed his career and his growth uh, in his barbecue career. He was really just hitting his stride as far as uh, what he was able to do, um, and what his staff was doing, and really what he was going to contribute uh, to his own restaurant. Now, what he contributed to the greater barbecue community, that had been going on for years and years. Uh, it was really just that consummate guy you could call up if you needed help um, as a restaurateur trying to work through any any sort of problems, whether it's cooking, financial, uh, marketing, uh, sausage making, all, all these things. Like you could just call John and he might not have the answer, uh, but he could talk you through it if he did and he'd find you somebody who might be able to help you if he didn't. So, uh, And he did that for everybody. Um, and you know, it's just, uh, it's, it's tough to find people like that these days. You know, there, there's a lot of work, a lot of attention that goes into running a barbecue joint that, uh, you know, creates reasons for people to not be able to do that. Right. Um, uh, but he never used that as an excuse. He, he was just always there to help. 
And he was always a huge cheerleader for the barbecue industry as well, uh, for just all of the barbecue joints out there. We've done our top 50 list for uh, many years now. And he was one of those guys who I knew he was going to go to all 50 of them. And this is, you know, dating back to the 2008 list, I think, uh, 2008, 2013, 2017, he was going to go to all of them and he was going to give me his honest feedback. And, uh, for the most part, I agreed with him, you know, when he would come back, it's like, yeah, well, John, that was kind of the 49th and 50th places to make it in. So your assessment kind of makes sense here. So, uh, uh, and I knew it was a huge goal of his to make the top 50 because he told me that he, he told me how important it was to him. Um, and you know, that didn't, uh, certainly didn't, didn't sway my evaluation of his restaurant, but I do remember the day quite distinctly because we were getting down toward the end. And, um, when we're getting down toward the end of the list, uh, of, uh, of trying to finalize that list, I am going all over the state and most people think that I'm trying to like uh, nail down our top 10. So <laughs> if I visit you at that time, almost everyone assumes that that's what they're in contention for, but I'm actually doing two things at the same time. I'm trying to finalize our top 10 and, and finalize that ranking from one to 10. And I'm also trying to finalize and that those places that are 45 to 55, which of those 10 or so are going to make it into the top, you know, which of the five of those 10 are going to make it into the top 50. And that's what I was doing on that, that day. Uh, and I stopped at Brotherton's first. Um, he was there, he was nervous, uh, but he didn't try and take over the block or anything. He, he let his cutter, who was Jason Tedford at the time, he, he let his cutter do the work, serve me the food. It was great. Uh, he asked me how everything was and I, I told him honestly how much I enjoyed it. Um, uh, and as I left, he just said, I hope everybody else sucks today. <laughs> <laughs> and wow. I knew exactly what he meant because yeah. he, he knew that I was in the Austin area, you know, making these sort of final cuts and final decisions and, and he made the cut. When you talk about how open he was to helping anybody, is he the exception when you look at a lot of the other operators around barbecue restaurants in Texas, or is that more the norm? Uh, I would say he's the exception in the doing part, right? Uh, there are there are more people who are willing to share the way that they cook and, and, and share tips and things like that uh, than there are not, right? That is the majority of, of barbecue joint owners out there. But as, some, as far as somebody who's going to like hop in the truck and drive to your place and, and help you work through uh, a certain issue that you're having with your pit or, um, you know, or show up at an event to help you out, even if he's not, uh, you know, one of the invitees to the event, uh, I, I remember cooking uh, with him for a um, it was a barbecue town hall at the at Texas A and M, and he was there cooking uh, for all the people who were there in attendance, and there was going to be a hundred hundred or so people there uh, who were really just all from the barbecue community, and he had volunteered to cook for it. Well, he had volunteered to cook fajita because you know that was something he could show up in the morning and, and do pretty quickly. And, uh, for some reason or another, I had like a midsection of a hog in my fridge that really needed cooked. And, uh, you know, it was like full, like from belly up to the, up, uh, up to the ribs, uh, up to the loin. And I was like, Hey John, you think uh, maybe we could cook this that morning? And he's like, yeah, that's going to like start my day at about 4 a.m. instead of about, you know, 9 a.m. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, uh, we agreed to meet and get the fire going and get the thing on. And, of course, when I showed up, he had already had the fire going. The pit was already ready, and, and we threw it on. And, and we really had a good time talking. That's when he shared with me just how much it meant to be uh, for him to be in the top 50. And, uh, yeah, it was uh, just good to be able to spend – uh, some of those one-on-one -on -one moments with him. So I appreciate the stories and the, and the look in on John for the folks that, that know him and a uh, huge loss that he's gone. A lot of folks in the instant chat echoing the same type of sentiments. You know, as we're talking about this list, uh, you know, recently you had the, you know, who's hot new 25. Um, I'm not calling it the right thing, but you know what I mean? The guy we've talked about on the show before who was also the focus of my documentary last year, Smoking Joe's Pit Barbecue. 
a confusing story that we hashed out last week finally. But as someone who covers Texas and sees places come and go, how common is it to see folks fall into the trap that Joe seemingly falls into, which is having a menu that seemingly wants to be all things to all people? Uh, yeah, that happens a lot, you know, uh, and that's the thing about starting when you're starting a business, especially when you're trying to serve out of a food truck, you don't have a big staff to help you. You got to keep it simple, right? You've got to keep it as simple as you can keep it as focused as you can, because that way you don't have to guess, right? Barbecue is a guessing game and somebody's going to lose. Are the customers going to lose because you sold out or are you going to lose because you got a lot of food left? And mm -hmm that's hard enough to determine when you're serving brisket rib sausage, but when you're serving eight different things and you've got to determine how much of it, to, how much of each one of those to cook every day just becomes much more complicated. Uh, not to mention just the, the effort in, in all the work to prepare all those different things. So yeah, trying to, you know, being able to keep it focused and, uh, you know, is, is a challenge to some people because they really want to show off what they can do and, you know, I hear it so often like, well, I'm in it for the passion. I want to show off what I can do and I want to, uh, you know, I want to impress people and all that. And it's like, well, in the end, you've got to be in it to make money. And if you, if that's not a goal of yours, then you're not going to last. Joe mentions that in the food truck, and you kind of mentioned it a couple of seconds ago, the problem is magnified because lack of overall space. And if it would have been in a traditional restaurant space, it would have been more manageable because increase space for things like food holders and the like uh, reality or little pie in the sky in that thought. Well, um, room more specifically for staff, right? Uh, you know, the, the, the people who can, can come in there and help you produce all this stuff. Um, you know, I look at Leroy and Lewis, uh, they have, they had a food truck or still have a food truck now, but they, they ran a food truck for seven years, all with the hopes of opening a brick and mortar. And, they had to keep their menu tight for seven years. They couldn't really branch out and do all of the things that they wanted to. They could do it in specials here and there, but as far as having the full menu the way they wanted it, they couldn't. They were operating out of a food truck. They just opened a month ago um, in a new brick and mortar location. Their menu is, it's pretty massive, right? They've, they've already told me in an interview, like they wanted to put it out as a really big menu and see where they needed to pare back, um, you know, as they got into it, you know, several weeks in or several months in, figure out what wasn't selling, but they wanted to start out big. They wanted to show off what they could do. And they finally had room for the staff, uh, to be able to produce all that and, uh, to hold all of that and to be able to produce it all really, really well. So, um, you know, that was, that took seven years of patience and then finally getting that brick and mortar, building up a name and a reputation that people, you know, enough people were going to show up to that new brick and mortar restaurant that they could do that huge variety of stuff. So that, that took a lot of time to build that foundation. Is Joe unique in the fact that he had a very substantial YouTube following built up prior to him getting into the food truck business? As you look across all the other operators in the state, are there a number of big places that have a similar video footprint or is Joe the exception to that rule? Joe's certainly the exception as far as somebody who started out with the YouTube platform and, and that popularity and then moved into to opening up his own place. Um, it almost always happens the other way around, right? Once you get a restaurant you get popular you get successful then people want to know how you're doing it and then you can uh maybe set up a, a patreon or set up s some way of getting your videos out there and um you know finding an audience who wants to watch them but uh rarely does it happen the way that in the order that joe did it you had mentioned one place beginning of the interview but how's barbecue in san diego these days otherwise uh, barbecue in San Diego, I found some impressive places. Uh, uh, Popolo Barbecue was really the one that I liked the most. Uh, I'm really out there more on a search for Texas-style barbecue, and um, they describe themselves as a Sonoran-style barbecue, but they did come and learn from Leroy and Lewis. Uh, they they have a, a similar 
adherence to, you know, using all wood to, to smoke everything and to make things with care, to make, uh, to be a little more creative with things. Um, another one that I really liked in town was Coop's, uh, Coop's West Texas barbecue. Uh, it was just a kind of a throwback place, right? It was a old school Texas barbecue. And sadly they, uh, announced that they're closing and they, I think only have this weekend. They're going to oh. uh, serving, serving through this weekend and, and then they'll be closing. Um, and then up North went to heritage barbecue up in Oceanside, uh, their, their newer location, uh, heritage brewery. There's a full brewery within the restaurant, uh, also really impressive. So, and, um, I'm headed out on another trip, uh, at the end of this week. So, um, if you, if you want me to break a little news where we go uh, on, on the show, all right, uh, barbecue stand by central show, exclusive news update, Greg Renfrey reporting for the breaking news desk here in Cleveland, Ohio, the city that breaks the most live fire breaking news across the country. Nay, the globe. And we go down to Texas where our pal Daniel Vaughn is getting ready to break news. Well, you know, every four years, Texas monthly, we do our uh, Texas monthly top 50. Uh, so the top 50 barbecue list. And then, as you mentioned in the, in, you know, two years in between, uh, we do our 25 best new barbecue joint list. Well, um, you know, this year in 2024, we decided maybe to do something a little bit different. I've been asked a lot about, uh, different barbecue joints that are doing Texas style barbecue outside the state. Uh, my opinions about them, I get requests to go visit a lot of these places. Um, and you know, I was really hamstrung. Most of my uh, coverage was about the barbecue joints in Texas, and that's what Texas Monthly was really willing to to fund, right, uh, was that sort of travel. And I had a discussion with my editor and, and with, the, uh, with the people who hold the purse strings and said, well, what if I set out and went all over the country um, in 2023 and 2024 and put together a top 50, probably uh, a top, barbecue list of texas style barbecue in the lower 48 that's not in texas hmm. and so um i've done pretty much everything up and down the the eastern you know the atlantic coast i've done quite a bit in the middle of the country um working my way through the west coast as well I've got some stuff to do up in the rocky mountains i've i've uh, i've still got several trips ahead of me but sometime in late summer uh, mm-hmm. We'll be putting out a list of the, uh, yeah, the, the 50, probably the 50 best, I think is, uh, seem, seems about right, given how 50 plays into so many of our other barbecue lists. But uh, yeah, the, the, the United States of Texas barbecue. Got to ask, yes or no, any Ohio barbecue restaurants making the list? I don't have any Ohio barbecue joints on the list right now, uh, but I will be making a trip there uh, in June, and yeah. I'll be letting you know when when I'm up that way. Uh, but you know, w- one of the things when I, I've when I talked to my editors about this, one of the questions came up like, "Well, what is Texas style?" And I said, "Well," and I, I often use uh, Mabel's as an example. Like, all right, we have Mabel's barbecue in Cleveland, a place that I, I really enjoy uh, and that certainly has a lot of DNA from Texas. But, you know, Michael Simon, as much as I love him, he's adamant. It's Cleveland style barbecue that that is not Texas style barbecue. It's what he's doing. So if you're not flying that Texas flag, then uh, it's not really it's not Texas style barbecue. Right. If, if you uh, like. So Popolo he, he barbecue precludes there, himself from being on the list because he's adamant about not being Texas style. That's right. Yeah. Oh. Um, uh, same with Popolo barbecue, right? They're Sonoran style barbecue. It's yeah. not Texas style barbecue by, mm. by their own description. And so uh, if your own description is, is saying that you're not Texas style barbecue, then I can't really uh, make that determination. You know, I can't certainly reverse that on my own. So are you running through the whole state of Ohio? Or are you coming up to Cleveland and hoping that the, the, the Gen Metro area of Cleveland's got Texas style barbecue? Because I think you're going to be disappointed. Well, um, no, I'm not, I'm not going all over the state. I, I, I had several disappointments in the Cincinnati area um, last year, uh, last summer. Um, I've got a spot in Columbus to check out. And, um, I do have another one up in Cleveland, but the thing is like about this list, 
the research for the top 50 barbecue list in Texas, uh, we have a, uh, it's, we cast a much wider net. Uh, there's places that look, you know, barely hopeful uh, that still make it on our list to try. Uh, this list, I am certainly being much more careful, mm -hmm. uh, much more stingy about the number of places I'm visiting. And, uh, you know, those, those photos that customers are uploading, those photos that, that the restaurants themselves are uploading to Facebook, photos on Yelp, all of these things uh, are helping to call this list, right? If it if it looks that bad in five different photos, like then it probably doesn't have much hope of making this list. So uh, I'm, I'm being a little bit more picky about the spots that I choose, but uh, I, I don't think I'll go to all 50 States uh, on this, on this trek. I mean, I don't think so. Gosh, that'd be a good thing to, to look into mate. I, I just might, um, but uh, I'm, I'm going to dang near all of them. Wow. So, yeah. Well, uh, as you know, you should be letting me know when you get in in June so we can hit up whatever around here, maybe make a out of barbecue experience uh, as well. If you're going to be around town, happy to run down to Larder and uh, some of the other places that are pretty cool outside of barbecue. So uh, this is Daniel Vaughn. You can find him at tmbbq.com. He's the barbecue editor over there, and he's a quarterly visitor here on this show, Danny, always appreciate the time, and we will see you in three months. All right. Appreciate it. Looking forward to it. Daniel Vaughn right there, doing a bang-up job as always, and that's going to be it. No, it's not. It is not going to be it. Just wait a minute. Where am I? Uh, pa -pa 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 -pa. Let's use this one. Yeah. We have to tell you about Big Papa Smokers because there's some free money in it for you. We don't want to forget about that. Our gang, our, our friends at Big Papa Smokers have something special just for you. The listeners of the show, whether you're a seasoned pit master or a grilling newbie, Big Papa Smokers, your one-stop shop for all things barbecue from their championship rubs, mouth-watering sauces, essential accessories. They've got what you need to take your food to the next level, whether... Or a competition cook, or you're just a backyard person like me. Here's the cherry on top. Big Papa Smokers is offering the listeners of the Barbecue Central Show an exclusive deal. Use code REMPE at checkout. That's R-E-M-P-E. -E, and you get $10 off your next $50 purchase of rubs, sauces, and accessories. So imagine the possibility. You can use sweet money and put it on your pork. You can put Big Papa's Desert Gold on your chicken and taste it and see what you think. Or better yet, pick up Double Secret Steak Rub and put it on your steak. Head on over to BigPapaSmokers.com right now and start shopping today and start saving today. And don't forget to use the promo code REMPE, R-E-M-P-E, at checkout to claim your $10 off your next order of $50 or more. Also, don't forget to check out the full line of recipes at CookingWithBigPapa.com. And, of course, follow them on social media. For amazing recipes. And now we are back to wrap the show. So stick around. We'll be right back. You know what? We're just going to wrap the show. Because all the way back in the first hour, we had Stephen Reichland for the first time in many months. Recapping his Abu Dhabi. And then because he was caught and stuck. No, Wes Wright. But in lieu of that, you got a great behind-the-scenes look at the Barbecue Central Show studio. And where the guest sits and the green screen, that's not a green screen. You got to take a look at all the knickknacks and tchotchkes and how the show operates. And again, it's just me. There's not a team of others. It's just me. So I had to get it all set up the way I could run it and still sound professional and produced professional second hour almost had my first conversation with john tezar but we missed it so we'll get, try and get that lined up asafp and then closing out the show in an extended fashion our pal daniel vaughn texas monthly's barbecue editor an exclusive announcement he is releasing a top 50 texas style barbecue restaurant list outside of texas if that makes sense. 
coming through Cleveland in June. I'll be here. Maybe we'll go to Johnny's Little Bar for a burger, and then we'll go West 130th for Glizzy's Schween Dog. Then we'll go get barbecue. Then we'll finish at Larder for charcuteries and heart and testicle paste stuff. Sounds great. All right, big show playing for you next week. It's the fourth Tuesday of the month. So you know we got embedded correspondence. And what are we adding to the embedded correspondence this month? A special guest appearance by Sam the Cooking Guy. He'll be sitting in. So how do I always leave you? September 11th, 2001. I will never forget. Until next Tuesday at 9 p.m. Eastern, this is your program host, the proud U.S. American, Greg Rempe. Good night now. This is Dion Blumenrader with Big Hoss One Sauce, and you're listening to the best show. This is Dion Blumenrader with Big Hoss One Sauce, and you're listening to the best show on all things barbecue with my man, Greg Rempe.